Hello, welcome to Premier Scene. I'm Claire Bueno and we are here for the penultimate night of the 54th BFI London Film Festival. We have a triple header for you this evening, starting with a financial documentary narrated by Matt Damon, Inside Job. Global losses are in the neighbourhood of 20, 30 trillion dollars, which is um, a fair amount of money, one would say. And what made you decide that this really needed to be highlighted and, and, and to be documented? Well, it's a world historical event. I, I decided to make the film the day after uh, Lehman Brothers, Merrill Lynch and AIG simultaneously collapsed. And uh, it seemed like an important thing to do. And, and as a producer, did you have trouble finding financing to actually make the documentary? Uh, we, we had a previous relationship with Sony Pictures Classics um, w because of No End in Sight. Um, we, knew, we, were f we knew them a little bit from that time and so we approached them with this idea and surprisingly they they were interested right away. And um, did you have any trouble finding people to contribute? Well some people of course refused. Uh, uh, nobody in the Obama administration would speak with us and none of the CEOs of any of the banks would speak with us on camera. Uh, so of course we did have some trouble but we were able to find many people including very high level people who were willing to talk. And also willing to talk is Matt Damon, the narrator of the documentary. How did you get him involved and was he reluctant at all? He wasn't. Um, we actually, we just asked him. You know, it doesn't hurt to ask. We, we really didn't think that we would get him, but it turned out that he was a, a fan of our previous film, No One in Sight, which was similar to Green Zone, as I, I understand. People have told me. So um, he agreed to do it for much less money than he's used to getting paid and he was wonderful and professional and amazing to work with. You, did you find the same? Yes, absolutely, very much so, yes. He was a pleasure to work with. He had very good suggestions about uh, the narration. And, uh, yeah, no, it was, it was a great experience. From, from a, a sort of filmmaking perspective, do you put the documentary together and then add the narration to it afterwards so that Matt can get a feel for what he's actually talking about? Well, we, we actually constructed the narration and the film simultaneously, but we finished uh, making the film and we finished the narration before we had him uh, actually speak the narration. And, and finally, what are your aspirations for the documentary and film? Well, we hope that this film will make people think that once they understand what happened here, which we try to convey in the course of the film, that uh, make people think and make people demand action so that this doesn't happen again. Do you think as well that maybe we should go to schools and um, educate people, children there, about how to handle our finances? Yes, I think that would be a great idea. I think I certainly could have benefited from that <laughs> as a yeah. younger person. Yes, we should learn how to manage our own finances. We should also manage uh, how the banking system treats us. Our next film we get to chat to director Hans Petter Molland for his new film, A Somewhat Gentle Man. So this has all the ingredients of a great film, hasn't it? Can you tell us more about it? <laughs> well, I hope it does, but you tell me. Uh, it's, a, it's a comedy, it's a film about a 58-year-old man who's being let out of prison and only leaves very reluctantly. He doesn't really want to leave. Uh, he has bad pension plan, he doesn't really want to, to leave. Uh, he has, sees no future. So it's really about his stumbling into the world and uh, being a bit naive, uh, being an easy target for his old uh, cronies who have lots of plans for him, including a murder. And it's a film with a lot of sex, a lot of bad sex, awful sex, uh, involuntary sex. But this time it's a man who's really, you know, he's quite a passive character. <laughs> doesn't know how to fend for himself, so he's being subjected to all kinds of women who thinks he's the cat's meow. How do you get the balance between the comedy and the drama as a, as a director? Oh... You've got bits of everything here, haven't you? It, it is drama, it is thriller, there's revenge, there's comedy. Yeah. And to get all those pieces of the puzzle, how do you picture it in your head? Or, it's hard to tell how your head is screwed together. You just kind of do it the way you know how. Now, I mean, it's making a comedy is quite difficult. You know, it's not about just going for emotional impact. It's also about uh, 
precision and about uh, the right kind of comedy at the right time. You know, if it's a, an absurd situation, then it should be absurd. It should not be slapstick. And if it's a situation comedy, it should be that. You know, so uh, comedy in many ways is a much more of a stringent affair. At least for me, it is. Uh, but I, I think uh, you have to have your heart in it and you have to just uh, go for it and be brave and uh, play with people that uh, want to play with you, you know. From a, from a filmmaker's perspective, uh, is it something, do you storyboard something like that? Uh, I haven't, with the exception of few, certain scenes where there's uh, action and stunts, I don't do that. Uh, but I have a very clear idea in my ha head how the mise-en-scene or the, the blocking will be, you know, and, uh, and that kind of dictates how the camera should be affecting the scene. And Stellan is your lead man, your protagonist. What's it been like working with him? Well, he's a lovely man, isn't he? He's uh, actually, to me, he's one of the most gifted actors in the world, and I think that's why he's a steady... Uh, He's always working, he's, uh, directors love him, other actors love him. I've done three films with him now and uh, we're good pals and we like to play together. We, at least to me he brings, he makes me courageous and I hope I do the same to him, you know. And he doesn't mind looking horrible and he has the most pathetic ponytail in this film, which uh, I think he wore with a bit of uh, distinction and honor, you know. Ever long for those nostalgic, carefree days of forgotten youth? Well, Greg Araki takes us back in his new film, Kaboom. Greg, what was the spark that made you want to, to write the story Kaboom? Uh, I'm trying to think. It had, it, I've been working on this project for a while. It was just sort of, I had this idea. Um, I wanted to make a movie sort of nostalgic, sort of reminiscence about like, your college days and that, you know, so when, when you're sort of like not really sure who you are or what you're gonna do yet and from there like a lot of these sort of Twin Peaksy kind of mystery elements sort of came about so it's kind of a, a blend of like sort of autobiographical stuff from my life and then a bunch of obviously completely fictionalized weird stuff too. <laughs> Hayley has Greg been able to connect to the youth as because yeah, obviously your youth is different to, yeah, to your, uh, yourselves. Generation. Um, I think, I mean, I think that it, it's it's somewhat linear, uh, <laughs> youth in general with the experimentation and and uh, everybody is just kind of searching for their own identity, so. It's always the same. <laughs> it's always the same. <laughs> Except there's more devices. Sex, device. drugs, and, and, yeah, and, sex and drugs and rock and roll has always been, roll. always been in fashion, I guess. And, and when you're making a film, is it different for you, the experience to directing a film that you've written to the, the ones that you haven't? Is it far more personal? Um, it's, it is different. I mean, the way I sort of, the, the analogy I use is um, the movies that I haven't written, there's only been one, which was Smiley Face, and then Mysterious Skin was based on a book, so I didn't create those characters, but I did um, adapt the book. Um, the way I sort of describe it, it's almost like children that are adopted versus children that are, you know, genetically yours, um, or biologically yours. Um, you know, you love them all the same, and they're, um, you know, my movies that have other people have written, I'm definitely so invested in, and I love them so much, and I am so proud of them. But um, it's, you know, it is sort of different when it comes out of your head, and that's kind of what Kaboom is. So. Hayley, how has that been for you as an actress, being directed by somebody who's written his own script? Uh, I think it, it's definitely a, um, more hands-on, and, and I, I, I mean, actually, to be honest, I, I don't really know how much of a difference that there is somebody who's written it to somebody who hasn't. I think it's their, you know, like you said, their baby project either way. <laughs> You're gonna, you know, try to do the best as you can as a director either either way. And Greg, you've had many awards from different film festivals. What's it like being now part of the BFI London Film Festival? I mean, it's amazing. I mean, I love I love the British audiences. I'm so excited for the screening tonight. Um, literally, I just got here from Los Angeles because I just wanted to, um, you know, come for the screening and see the see the UK uh, be here for the UK premiere. So. I'm, it's awesome. I mean, yeah, I've always, I've always been very into British culture and British music. Anybody who's seen any of my movies knows, like, all my favorite bands are from, are from London or the UK. And so I've always had this strong tie to the UK, and I'm so excited to be here. So there you have it, three more different films you couldn't find, and that is the beauty of the BFI London Film Festival. Join us tomorrow for our very last day. I'm Claire Bueno, signing out for Premier Scene.